Welcome to Noon Hour Slides from the Moose Jaw Museum and Art Gallery. We're located on Treaty 4 territory, the traditional lands of the Blackfoot, Cree, Ojibwe, Soto, Dakota, Nakota, Lakota, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We pay our respects to First Nations and Métis ancestors and reaffirm our relationship with one another. We gratefully acknowledge funding from the City of Moose Jaw, Sask Arts, Sask Culture, Saskatchewan Lotteries, Canada Council for the Arts, Canadian Heritage, and the Government of Canada. I'm Vincent Rotelling, the Administrative Assistant here, and I'm here to welcome you to today's presentation. Dave Wentworth is here to talk about a safari in Tanzania. Welcome. Great. Thanks, Vincent. Thank you, everybody, for taking some time out of your uh, day here to join me. We have a great afternoon coming up here in Moose Jaw, and I hope you will be like me and you'll get out and enjoy the weather. But um, I, I tell you, I'm here today to talk about a really outdoor experience, and that was going to Tanzania on safari, but by doing it in a camping style, which was really unique and really down to earth. Um, so my contact information is down on the bottom. If there's any questions I don't uh, touch on, I'm going to have some time at the end, and you can always reach out to me here in the community. I just love talking about travel, and I'm really excited to be here today. So um, this was um, the pictures uh, contained in this presentation are pictures that I took during my personal safari, which was in May 2013. That was my first time traveling to Africa and it left me with a strong affection for the continent. And I'm really privileged to have had the chance to go back to Africa. I've done four trips to Africa and as soon as travel resumes again, I'll be going on my fifth trip to Africa. It is probably one of my most favorite spots. Ever since I was a boy growing up, I dreamt of seeing the wildlife of Africa. I can remember watching movies like Out of Africa with my mother and wanting to have those sort of safari experiences. And maybe you're like me, maybe before you've sat in front of um, the Nature Channel and seen Wild Africa and thought, wow, that's something I really like to do. And maybe some of you have had the chance to do that and know how wonderful it is. So let's get going and discover the magic of Africa together today. Um, again, a bit about myself. I am new to the Moose Jaw area. Um, I've been involved in the travel industry for 15 years. I did a degree in international development, so I've always been very passionate about ecotourism, adventure tourism, um, conservation through tourism. And with that interest, it's taken me to 37 countries around the world. Um, and I was saying in my last slide, my next trip will be to Africa. And if I get my pick, I'd, I'd love to go to Ethiopia and check out the cultural attractions there. So yeah, so Africa is a really big place. It's so big, my computer was like spinning it. It couldn't handle all these countries. There's over 50 countries in Africa and we can divide it down into four sections. So I've color coded those for your reference today. The yellow at the top is North Africa. It's the Sahara Desert. We have in the green section, East Africa, where we'll head off to today. And that's an area that's known really for conservation and animal attractions. In the blue, you have Southern Africa, which is different than the rest of Africa. They go Go through the four seasons there. It's not a cut and dry, uh, wet and um, dry season. And then in the pink, we have West and Central Africa, where we have a lot of cultural connections, a lot of colonial countries. Um, so my four trips to Africa have touched on each one of these areas, and they're all very different. Tanzania, though, that's the one that's in black. So to give you a visual, that's where we're headed today. It is just south of the equator. So it's always really hot in uh, Tanzania. Again, there's a dry season, there's a wet season, and that's about it. Um, it borders a few major waterways. I've put those in the left for you. And it borders a number of other African countries. Sometimes people combine going to Kenya and uh, Tanzania on the same trip. And their languages there are Swahili and they speak Swahili in Tanzania and Kenya. And they also speak English. That's a result of the British impact of colonialism. So as a visitor, if you are in Tanzania, you'll have no problems communicating with people. Um, and Tanzania up close and personal, uh, if we look at this map, there are three major points of access. There is Dar es Salaam, which is the capital that's located on the coast. There's Kilimanjaro up in the north. That's where I flew in and out of. That's where our safari will take us today. And then if you're a beach person and you like great weather, then Zanzibar is located on the coast and there's a major airport there. 
Um, speaking in terms of Canadian travelers, you do need a passport that's valid for six months beyond your stay in Tanzania, and you do need to have a visa. And the visa can be obtained on arrival. For the last numbers of years, it's been consistent. It's $50 US, and you pay that in cash and get your visa at the airport. So it just takes five minutes after you land. It's really easy. And if you're coming from a yellow fever country, um, you would need to show a yellow fever vaccine. So if you're coming over from Kenya, or I flew over, I connected in Ethiopia, um, those countries have yellow fever. So that was an inoculation I had to get. And a travel nurse would be able to confirm the latest with you. But uh, yeah, so um, my safari in um, a nutshell, um was in this closer zoom in of tanzania and i hit all of the major national parks which are in the deep green and i also went up to lake natron which was really special and that's located up in the north here along the border of kenya and as i was saying in the beginning of our uh presentation i did a camping safari and i did camping safari for a number of reasons um it for me, it was something really different. I had actually never done a lot of camping here in Canada, and I had never pitched a tent, and I thought it would be really cool to uh, have an experience like going on the game show Survivor. So with that in, in my mind, I went for a camping option. It is your most economical option if you're looking for um, to stretch your dollar in a safari situation, but it's also the most natural situation. You can do participatory and guided camping. Uh, participatory is a little bit more economical. It's where you'll set up the tent, you'll participate in chopping up veggies, cooking dinner, um, setting up the campfire and tearing it all down the next day when it's ready to go. Or you can do a guided camping experience Experience, which is what I did. So um, our guide would set up the tent for us. We had a, a chef come in the safari vehicle. You can see our safari vehicle just over here. This is fairly typical of a campsite. So they would reverse in to unload. And the back of the safari vehicle is where they carried all of our gear. We were on a seven day, six night safari. So all the food, all the drinks, everything had to be brought out there. So our vehicle carried us up by the door and then in the back was pretty much cargo. Um, there is a mess hall to eat, um, just really rudimentary tables. Uh, water is provided for washing hands. Um, over here in the brick slab area, there's a small cooker area so that hot food could be ready. Other than that, um, there's not a lot going on in this particular campsite, which was in northern Serengeti. We had two shower facilities. However, my guide brought to our attention that one shower pit had snakes and the other shower pit had an infestation of baboons so that maybe we shouldn't take a shower that day. So I didn't get a shower that day because the animals were there and they rule in Africa. If you are not a camper, there are other options. You can do lodges and there's luxury and all sorts of fantasy things that you can do in Africa. And contrary to what my mother thought, you won't be eaten by a lion. Um, the wildlife will not get in your way when you're camping. Um, you'll, it's wild because you can look across and see the lions, you can see the elephants, but they're truly doing their own thing. Um, you can't go out at night. So when the sun sets in a camping safari situation, you are in your tent. Um, until the sun comes up and they give you a bell. So if you are in an emergency situation in an emergency way, you can ring your bell and your guide will come. But typically the idea is that at nighttime, that is when the animals will come out. That's when we can't see the animals. And that's when it's not safe to be out. But other than that, through the day in Africa, the animals really are overly interested in you or I. All right, so this is my camping um, tent. This is the tent that was provided by our tour operator. So I didn't have to take any particular gear to Africa. That was all waiting for me. And um, this was home for six nights. Um, we slept in here. This was a two-man tent. And in behind us, you can see another example of an open air um, mess hall. So that would be where dinner would be taken. And behind me, you can't see it in the photograph, but there would have been another cooking area so that our um, chef would be able to make dinner for us and keep us going that way. 
So a typical day in um, Africa, if we were doing safari drives, we'd be up from the crack of dawn to have breakfast and in the vehicle about 60 or 30 minutes after sunup, and we would drive for 12 hours to see animals all day long. If we were moving from one area to another, we'd be on the road those days. It would also be an early start, but we could be looking at driving four hours, which sometimes in Africa will turn into six and then a tire will broke and then you'll be traveling eight hours. And uh, by the time we would get to the next national park, it would be late in the afternoon. So they would set us up. The guide would take us for a quick drive while the um, chef cooked. And so we get to see the sunset. We get to see the animals transition from day to night. And then we would come back and have dinner and, and again, pretty much head straight to bed. That's it. And so the first national park I visited was called Tarangiri, and it's really common on a lot of safari circuits that you'll go to Tarangiri first. It's one of the closest ones to the airport, so it makes that first day a little bit quicker. Um, there's paved roads straight there, so you're not on a bumpy African uh, road. When you are in a safari vehicle, often the roads are, are quite crappy, and I'll show you some pictures of that. It will make moose jaws potholes seem inconsequential to you. Um, and you bump around a lot. Um, but Tarangiri, you have a nice um, brand new highway going in there. It's named after the Tarangiri uh, river, which is photographed here. And um, it's really cool too, because you get all five of the big animals and it's especially abundant with elephants. Um, my fantasy was fulfilled because within five minutes of entering this national park, I had seen lions, giraffes and elephants all in abundance. And I have a picture of that coming up here in the next slide. That river also keeps this area really lush. So um, yeah, this is my first day in Africa. You might be able to see on my left eye in the picture, I, I unfortunately had a bit of a reaction to the um, ecosystem, just to different antihistamines and my sinuses went off. So um, my eye will start to look better as the safari unfolds, but this was really exciting because again, this was within five minutes of going on safari. And I mean, that's exactly what you're there to see uh, the animals up close and personal. Um, often I get questions about the safari vehicle as well, how the top works. So it's interesting to point out, you can see here the top is popped. I'm able to stand up and, and lean back and feel the wind. They open those during your drives in national parks, conservation areas, and um, other reserves they have to close it by law when you're driving on the highway. So whenever you're in a national park, they're gonna open this up and offer you additional vantage. It even works in the rain quite well to uh, keep the raindrops out. Lions were also uh, on abundance in Tarangiri National Park. And I like this picture because it was taken pretty much minutes apart. It's the same lion, but it just shows you in the lower left when the lion moves, how quickly the tall grass will camouflage them. And so sometimes you're driving around and I found, especially my first day or two of safari, the guide would be able to say, look, there's a lion or something. And, and I'd be like, where, where, where is this lion? And it, it, it was right in front of me, but you, you know, you need to learn how to look for it. And that was totally new for me. Giraffe um, are also found in all of the national parks I'm gonna talk about today, but of course can be found in Tarangiri as well. This is a photograph uh, from Tarangiri that you're looking at. And interesting with the giraffe is that you can tell um, the area of Africa a giraffe comes from based on its spots. So here you can see kind of a chocolatey color um, spot and towards South Africa, the further you go down on the continent, they become darker. They can almost become like the color um, shifts from milk chocolate to dark chocolate. So I found that really fascinating to learn all these different things. And of course, when you are on a safari, your guide is an encyclopedia of information and is constantly giving you information. To be honest, more information than your brain can probably handle. It's just a constant stream of everything from the smallest things like insects that we would see or birds to, of course, the big animals, the exciting animals. The landscape in Tarangiri is dominated by this type of tree that you see um, with the thorns that comes up. That's an acacia tree. And then over on the side, there's a thicker, fatter tree. That's called a baobab tree, which is commonly found in all parts of Africa, but uniquely to Africa. And they're huge. It can take like 10 people to stretch around hand in hand to go around these, these baobab trees whereas the acacia ones are, are much more slender. 
and a real popular activity on safari because there is no wi-fi you do not have a tv in your room to go home to no pool nothing like that so the really only form of entertainment is to watch the sunsets and they're glorious and you can see in this uh, photo in the lower left that uh, the sunset really came out well with the silhouette of the acacia trees so this was all on my first day in Tarangiri, and of course I still had a number of days left to go and speaking of on the go these great ostrich tell us that it is time to head up to Lake Natron so moving from Tarangiri to Lake Natron that was a really long drive that was about six or seven hours we were on that nice paved highway at the beginning for about an hour and then I literally recall our driver just turning off onto the field and just driving through open fields for five hours and in five hours we maybe went 100 150 kilometers it wasn't overly fast going but that was how we had to get to Lake Natron and um, just another close-up of the vehicle this is the only picture I have that's not my own I emailed the tour operator to request a copy for today's presentation but just so you can see again like when that top is popped up you can definitely be able to stand up you're above the shoulders you can get your camera out if you shoot with wide lens you can make that happen and a cool thing when you do a private safari so again for me it was just the two of us uh, maybe it's you know yourself and your partner maybe it's a couple couples you can say we want to stay here longer we're enjoying this view we want to continue watching these elephants and they'll stay longer or if you're bored with what you're looking at you can say let's go on and find something else so um it, it's just really cool to be able to again move around the savannah and check everything out they do have fridges in the um in the vehicle as well which is really great so they have uh, cold bottles of water or if you do want to bring some beers along that's possible as well um and they do have basic power outlets um so charging i in hindsight wish i would have taken more power packs because i did start to lose camera pattern uh, battery power at the end of my safari and it was hard to recover because i couldn't get a lot of charge out of the vehicles hopefully that will improve again i was there in 2013 um, and again, you got the um, the camping safari comes with the chef. If you're not doing a camping safari, there won't be a chef. It will just be your, your car and driver for the week. So Lake Natron is a real oddity in nature. It is a bizarre natural habitat because it has highly caustic waters. So if you're into the science of it all, it has a pH of 10 and a half. Um, which is just off the charts, highly salty water. It's very corrosive. And um, the, I did start to see some things float around on social media, on some travel blogs saying that this is a lake that is fatal to all animals, that they think they were calling it Medusa's Lake, that if you went into it, you would turn to calcium or turn to rock. That's not true. Um, when animals die, calcium, they will be calcified because the high amount of deposits, but it isn't a toxic lake. It's just that not many creatures can uh, inhabit here. The creature that can inhabit this area in the greatest abundance is the lesser African flamingo, which you see photographed here. They nest here in abundance because of two things. There's krill in the water, so microplanktons that they can eat. And also there are other animals that would hunt them, the lions, uh, the water buffaloes, the hyenas, they can't come here because it, it, they are driven away because it's so toxic. So in an eerie way, because this um, lake is so toxic, it's able to support these beautiful flamboyant pink flamingos. Um, so I, that's why I, I went there. It was kind of a deviation from seeing the regular animals on safari and just about seeing some unusual nature. And they had a really interesting time up there as well. We had a a local guide so this is a guide who's from the lake natron area you see photographed on the right and uh, he gave me an outfit to wear that's traditional of a maasai warrior i i think i could be moose jaws only maasai warrior perhaps and in the left you can see me um in front of a volcano in the area it's called mount meru and that um volcano is active some people do trek that mountain and there is um geology that happens from that volcano that does feed into lake natron so that's kind of one of the things that makes La lake natron so calcified so salinated 
obviously once we saw the lake, once we saw the flamingos, there was not much to do. So it was back in the vehicle. That was only one night at Lake Natron and over to the Serengeti. Now the Serengeti is mega, mega huge. Uh, you're definitely going to want to go there. I think it's probably one of the most recognizable names, and it's the Tanzanian extension of um, the Masai Mara. So it's a huge park that straddles. It's like Cypress Hills. It goes in two areas. Um, in Kenya, they call it the Masai Mara. In Tanzania, they call it the Serengeti. And it's rich in all natural wonders, but also it is the birthplace of mankind. And we'll talk about that here in a few slides. Uh, slides. To give you some perspective, the Serengeti is um, 30,000 square kilometers, so it's huge. We spent two nights, one night camping in northern Serengeti, and then we got in the vehicle and loaded all the camping gear in, and we went south to uh, a campsite in South Serengeti. So two nights in the park at two different campsites to try to spread around and, and see as much as I could in the two days that we had. Um, Serengeti also has a number of airstrips, so I mean if you're in a situation where you're just living it up, you can really fly from place to place in the park. I was overlanding it. Um, really cool picture here of zebras. Again, I spoke a few slides ago about how your guide will give you so much information about animals that you may not have known. One thing I didn't know about this zebra, which is the Gervy zebra, is that their um, stripage is, is unique as a human um, fingerprint. And so that's how they can tell each other apart because they can recognize the subtle details in their striping. And one thing that was unique in this photo is that you can see the zebras are standing in the back um, butt to butt. And um, that's really unusual. You'll typically see a zebra, um, one will stand uh, this way and the other will stand the opposite way. So they can always be on the lookout for predators. They're one of the most sought after animals in the animal kingdom. So to see them at a moment like this, it's, it's kind of unusual. And uh, definitely uh, coming back to that camera and batteries, um, you know, you're, you really want to have that camera at the ready at all time because you just never know when Africa is going to give you some amazing nature. Um, one thing I always like to talk about with people that are thinking about going to Africa that have interest is what time of year you go to Africa. And so I think this is a really good time to talk about that. I chose to go to Africa in late May, because that's when, in Tanzania at least, it works out really well to see the wildebeest migration, and I'll have some slides on that and details coming up. But also, I love baby animals. Um, I'm that person who just loves watching videos of baby animals, and I wanted to see the baby animals, and so the juveniles come along in late May. They're normally birthed in March, uh, but that's not as interesting to see. It's, it's really cool to see them when they're still young babies and as you can see in the picture of the right this was uh, that photo was not zoomed in the one on the right I was literally that up close and personal um, from the safety of my vehicle watching this mama teach her baby how to lapse water and it was super cute because the baby was falling into the water and you know they were had she was cleaning his face and you just again see nature happening as it's intended to be and on the um, left, you can see, again, we have the top popped because we're inside of a national park, so we can do that. And the lion is just walking by. Again, offering you tidbits today about animals in Africa and how they behave. A lion um, will not attack you on safari as long as you are in your vehicle. So when you're out for the days, you can't just jump out to take a picture. You have to stay in your vehicle. When you jump out, they recognize the silhouette of man and know that that's something that they can attack, it's moving, but they actually see the safari vehicles as just a hill or a rock. Uh, sometimes they'll actually take a cover and lay in the shade of the vehicle thinking it's just a big rock. So again, they, they're not on to you, but you're definitely on to them. Um, wide open spaces. So I moved to Saskatchewan a couple years ago and I, um, have, since I've come here, I've, I often say with my friends when we're driving around, especially down uh, a grid road, that um, sometimes Saskatchewan reminds me a lot of Africa. And the picture in the left shows you why I think that, because there's a wide open sky, it's a living sky, there's amazing sunsets, there's this endless flat plain and one dirt road going through a bunch of territory few scrubby trees and uh, I tell you if we had some lions and zebras and giraffes here in the province we could really offer Canadians an African experience without leaving their borders 
And then on the right side, we have um, here a water buffalo. They're one of the most dangerous animals. You definitely do not want to encounter one of them. Um, and we had a situation at the Ngorogoro Crater where there were some water buffalo blocking the footpath from the campsite to the uh, men's bathroom. So everybody had to use the bathroom, uh, the staff bathroom that night. Um, so just more bathroom drama on my safari because of animals blocking my path. But again, it's Africa and they rule. Another animal that you're guaranteed to see in the Serengeti because there's a lot of waterways are the hippos. And hippos are also one of the most ferocious animals. And so to encounter one on land could be incredibly trepidatious, but watching them in the water, I could just do that for hours. I mean, it stinks to the high heavens and you know why it does. Um, but the thing that amazed me about the hippos, and if you see in the picture in the lower left, is that when they're down in the water hole, I just couldn't help but think about how big each hippo is. And you can just see they're all in there, boom, 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 like they're stacked in like a full parking lot. And it's, it's a tip of the iceberg situation, you know, sometimes you just see those pink ears and eyes poke out of the water and you know you're only looking at a small percentage of this animal that there's so much more that's under the water. So definitely gonna check out some hippos. And then another star attraction, one of the reasons why I did a um, camping safari was so that I could have the opportunity to do a hot air balloon. I stretched my budget out a little bit um, by camping so I could do the balloon. And this was a total bucket list item for me. So a balloon safari in Africa, if it's something that you're interested in doing, you're going to be up probably your earliest day because it's going to be before sunset uh, or pardon me sunrise you'll be woken up and driven to the drop site um, these balloons go up with the sunrise it's how it works with the barometric pressure and you'll be having a one hour um, aerial safari which is great now I've had the opportunity to do hot air balloon here and in Cap or, or here meaning Serengeti and in Cappadocia and I enjoyed it so much more in Africa because it wasn't about this going up as high as possible, which we did in Turkey. It was about going really low. And there were some times where I almost clenched because I felt we were just gonna graze over the tree and, and maybe braze it a little bit as we went across. And we never did. It was just the best control ever by our pilot. And um, yeah, so you can see the animals from the sky and you're about high enough that you know your camera's still going to work without zoom but they can't see you so they literally have no idea and we were able to float over a water hole and that was something i just didn't get pictures of because i was so busy looking at it because i could see these hippos again from the sky and it was morning so they were actually just coming in from their nighttime of grazing on the savannah to lodge back into the water and you know get into the mud for the day so just seeing animals being animals doing their thing it was wonderful and a cool thing about the hot air balloon, before I forget, is that because hot air balloons have an association with French culture via the Montgolfier brothers, you always typically have champagne when you land at a champ uh, uh, in a hot air balloon. Definitely in Tanzania, they make that custom happen. And so after being camping for now four or five days, I hadn't had a, a drop of hot water to clean my body. So I was just doing what I could do. Um, it felt amazing to have a champagne breakfast and they pulled out all the stops. There was a full uh, English style breakfast. Um, and again, to compare to Survivor, I felt like I was on the luxury challenge. It was a, that was a really great morning in, um, in Tanzania. It's all over by about 10 o'clock and our guide picked us back up and we just continued with the usual ebb and flow, which was more um, driving. This was our second day in the Serengeti and we wanted to check out the South Serengeti. Um, South Serengeti, again, it's it's getting away from some of the waters, so it's a bit drier, so you find more of this arid landscape like you see in the left photo. Again, that's another picture of the acacia tree, and giraffes are typically going to be spotted when you're around the acacia trees because the green parts are thorny, prickly bush and no animals can eat uh, the fruits that grow in there. Um, the fruit actually uh, makes Amarula liquor, if you've ever sampled that liqueur that's made from the, the nut. But uh, giraffes can eat it anyhow, and that was my tidbit to you, that they have an unusual tongue that can allow them to process the thorns, to spit them away, and to get the good parts. Uh, but they're really the only animal that can, can use them 
the um, acacia trees. So that's why when you see a lot of acacias, you're gonna see some giraffes as well. Um, we were really lucky as well on the right. And this was a photo that when I took it, I had to zoom in probably as much as my camera was allowed um, was to get a leopard. And uh, that that's that really is, in my opinion, and I think a lot of guides would agree, it's, it's probably one of your rare animals to get. They're incredibly evasive, they're fast moving, and they camouflage really well. So just trying to find one, it's a needle in a haystack. Uh, I spoke earlier about the wildebeest migration. So again, my timing of doing a safari in um, this part of Africa in May was to coincide with the wildebeest migration. The wildebeest basically move in a circular pattern throughout the Maasai Mara and Serengeti. So if you're able to go to Africa in a particular month, um, you just have to look to see where they're gonna be at. It's it's very predictable. It's, it is truly like clockwork because as there are 12 hours uh, in the hands of a clock, there are 12 months in a year and the animals just move around that circle. So you just gotta make sure you're in the right spot at the right time. And because the wildebeest uh, migrate in flocks of over a million wildebeest, uh, you'll know when they're coming. And uh, one thing that was funny for us, and maybe a blessing in disguise was that we were driving, of course, on these um, dirt roads and we blew a tire. And I mean, they totally expect that to happen. That's why the safari vehicle is equipped with an extra tire and all the kits. So it was really no big business. It was just going to get changed and uh, we just had to wait it out. Now, typically on these safari lunches um, would be a lunchbox situation. So we'd have a sandwich, a piece of fruit, a juice box, maybe some cookies. So our guide just said, well, how about you guys take lunch? And uh, as we were sitting on the back of the truck, eating our sandwiches, the wildebeest migration started coming. So we actually had to get back in the vehicle and eat our lunch as all of this was happening around us. The amount of dust that was stirred from all of those creatures just herding along and so noisy. I have a pug at home and it's just that case of snorting kind of noise of all these wildebeest just doing their thing, just totally wild. And we also saw a lot of zebra there because the zebra will run with uh, wildebeest. They do that to protect themselves from um, attackers. So after two days in the Serengeti, um, I, I mean, I could have spent more time there, but our itinerary meant that we had to move. So we were over to the Ngorogoro crater. This area um, is incredibly interesting for two reasons. It is a volcanic caldera, so it makes seeing the animals particularly easy. It is about 20 kilometers one way and 10, 15 kilometers the other. And inside of this oval, there are all these animals that kind of don't come in or out of the caldera. So it's like kind of seeing fish in an aquarium. They're all there for you. Um, because there were so many animals, you'll see in my next slide, I was able to get shots of like two different species in the same frame, which was uh, really cool to see. But the other thing that should interest you about the Ngoro Goro Crater is that it is home to the Oldify Gorge, which is the cradle of humanity. So that's going back to Lakey's anthropology and, and finding the earliest, most primitive forms of man that, uh, that we currently know about. So is this where it all began? You can philosophize and wonder that very question at the spot when you're in the Ngoro Goro Crater. Now, because it is a caldera, we didn't spend a ton of time here. I think this drive is really only a couple of hours and probably could have uh, come in at our shortest drive. But again, it was exquisite to see some amazing bird life as you see in the lower left. I unfortunately do not know the name of that uh, bird to tell you, but I was attracted to it because of its uh, feathers, um, because of its wide wings. It just commanded attention and, um, in the right, we have a picture again, what I was talking about, a capturing two species. Um, having done the safari experience, one piece of feedback if for people that haven't done it but are interested is that, you know, you really do want to think about how long you're in the field. I was there uh, again a week and you do start to see everything. So then you're looking for different things. So for me, that was finding two species in the same shot. Um, great. Somebody has commented in chat, so I can share with anybody who's not seeing, it's a great uh, gray crowned crane. Thank you for that added tidbit. 
All right. So again, lions, everybody wants to see a lion. Um, when we were in Africa, our guide would point to the lions at the very beginning and he would say, Simba, Simba. And because of my age and, you know, I grew up with the Lion King, I thought that they were simply just trying to um, stoke my energy by, you know, rekindling the Lion King. But the word in Swahili for lion is actually Simba. So I, I learned a little Swahili on this trip. And uh, we saw Simba throughout. These are female lions. You can pick up on that because of the lack of mane. Um, we did see some male lions as well, but I wanted to show these ones because what you see in the left would have been the safari vehicle behind us. So in Ngorogoro, because again, it is that caldera, it can get a little bit uh, crowded with cars. So a, a traffic jam on the safari savanna. And uh, so I was able to photograph the car behind us and you can see that the lion here is just sultry walking uh, right next to the vehicle. And again, they'll, they do this because in their perception, it's a rock and it's a, it's a way to take, um, get, get some shade. You can see the female lion next to me um, is stretching out. If you can see her paws are in the front. And again, from the photograph, we can see she's just in the shaded area of the vehicle getting out of the hot African sun. So literally the lions will come to you and you can get really up close with them um, from a safe way. Um, from Ngorogoro Crater, we went to Lake Benyara. That was our last technical stop on the safari, but in going from point A to point B, we did go through a Maasai village and we stopped at a Maasai village. Now this is a Maasai village that was open for tourism. Um, we had driven through other Maasai villages, but our guide told us, you know, we don't stop here. These communities don't have sites to see, you know, they're not overly welcoming to visitors. They're not used to tourism, um, especially up around Lake Natron where fewer people go. But this one's kind of on the main uh, junket. And so they're more familiarized. With that comes some of the unfortunate aspects. You can see in the left of the picture on the right, they're on the, the wall of their homes, their bulmas are necklaces, earrings, and other beaded work. And you know, there is an aggressive sell um, to buy their artworks there. Um, emotions sometimes can get pawned and um, you know it, it can be hard on our hearts when we see children and living in such primitive ways. Um, having said this, uh, as a piece of feedback, I still highly recommend having an encounter with the Maasai, particularly if you can, you know, have it in an appropriate uh, context, because these are the people of Africa, and their culture is so beautiful. Um, I am pictured in the left um, attending the schoolhouse that was built in this village, and so we get to go into the school and see the kids, and this little guy just had to try on my glasses, and for me, just watching the kids play, um, it, it was just totally refreshing, um, seeing the women prepare the beads and thread the beads. That was really cool to see that role in the community. And the men um, jump, they go up and down. I think I have a picture of that coming up and they invited me to jump with them, but I can't jump as high as the Maasai warrior can. They've had a lot more practice than I have. I think that slide comes up at the end for my thank you slide of me jumping. So just stay tuned for that a little bit longer. We just have a few more minutes to go today, so I'll start winding down with my final um, national park. Um, and again, Mike, as I was saying earlier, my, my cameras were dying. It was 2013. I didn't have a camera phone with me. I um, was getting low on juice at Lake Minera, and that was our final national park that we visited. That's the one on the left. Lake Minera is known for having a different type of giraffe, which you can see in the photograph here. Um, and when I say different, its spots are, again, more that darker chocolate that you would normally catch in Southern Africa. And in the right is Mount Kilimanjaro. So I flew in and out of Kilimanjaro International Airport. It's named after the mountain and the mountain is a, um, you know, it's the rooftop of Africa. If you're interested in climbing Mount Kilimanjaro, it's something I can come back and speak about another time. I personally haven't done it, but as um, running an adventure travel agency, it's something I, in regular times, prepare typically about uh, 12 uh, people uh, a year for going up Mount Kilimanjaro. So it definitely can be done if you're into hiking. I am not, I zipped off to Seychelles after this. And again, that could be a presentation for another day. I was totally fulfilled. So in wrapping up, um, I 
would uh, just kind of say if anybody has any questions that you want me to touch on that I haven't touched on, now would be a great time to pop them into the chat. I see a few people using the chat. Whoops. And I'm just going to go back. I wanted to just give you a few pointers on East and South Africa. So again, going back to our first slide, East Africa is the green zone um, and Southern Africa would be the green uh, underneath of that, the blue zone. So obviously South Africa and uh, its adjacent countries. Um, that the east, it's closer to the equator, so it's a more precise dry and wet season, so it can be very predictable. So if you're looking for certain ex experiences, you can pretty much hit the nail right on the head um, by looking at the calendar and planning when you go. Uh, wet season is great in that it's a bit cooler, uh, it's not as dusty, so if you're prone to any respiratory illnesses, or conditions, it can be a little bit easier to breathe the air. However, the roads can be muddier and that can make the drive a little bit more uncomfortable. So there's always a pro and a con when you're considering. Uh, dry season, uh, and I was there at the beginning of the dry season, uh, is getting dustier. Um, so the dust is flying, it, 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 you get a little dirtier when you're out on safari. Um, but the water holes are shrinking and what's great about that is that animals will congress around the water holes so you can see the animals with a bit more ease and predictability. Um, east is where you have the Maasai Mara, Serengeti, Ngorongoro, Kilimanjaro, the spots we talked about today. And in the south you have Cape Town, you have Victoria Falls. In the south I would say you have more to see. You could see the wineries of South Africa. If you're looking to go to Africa and you want to do more than just see animals, the south might be good for you. Um, when it depends um, on the specific uh, itinerary, East Africa does tend to require more inoculations, more needles. So if you're not looking for that, if you want to minimize that, you might want to consider South Malaria. Um, East Africa is, all of it is a malaria zone, so you'd be taking malaria pills. South Africa, there are areas that are malaria free. So again, if you have concerns about that, you might want to be thinking East or South. And uh, yeah, so, and then plan for the right amount of time of safari. Don't do too much animals and get bored with it. Add some culture and add some time for relaxation. A lot of people like going to the beaches of Zanzibar. So those are my notes on that. And finally, my tips, bring bug spray and appropriate safari attire. No one told me what to bring uh, for clothes. So I just brought a lot of like blue and black polo shirts kind of like I'm wearing today, only to find out that the tsetse fly, which is a, a aggressive biting fly in Africa, it doesn't transmit disease, but it hurts like a horse fly bite. Well, it's attracted to blue and black. So that was coming at me. There's a reason why when you see in classic safari imagery, uh, white starch shirts and uh, tortoise shell hats, there's a reason why they keep the colors basic. So I'd recommend that. Um, expect the unexpected. You never know when great scenery, landscape will come up, a beautiful sky, and hakuna matata means no worries. So maybe your truck will break down like mine did, but then that could open the door to have lunch as the wildebeest migration uh, passes by. So just be open to it and go with that flow. And again, camping is great, but lodges definitely exist if you would like a bit more creature comfort. So um, if you want to keep in touch with me, again, I'm new. If you Google me um, or look on social media channels, you can find me. Uh, my name is Dave Wentworth. My business title is Destination Whatever because I do have a desire for unusual destinations. That's kind of my specialty. You can find me on Facebook. You can find me on Instagram. And I've been active on YouTube. I'm making videos right now to promote Loose Jaw and show landscape around the local area. Um, so please check me out if you'd like to see some of the content I'm producing virally there. And I just wanted to, ah, not close that slide so quickly. I wanted to say thank you, or as we would say in the Swahili language, Asante. I'd like to say thank you again to the Moose Jaw uh, Museum and Art Gallery for allowing me to be today's presenter. Uh, I was debating presenting Ireland, being that it is St. Patrick's Day, but I thought in my head, what's a greener destination? And for me, that will always be my natural time spent in Tanzania. And um, now I am available for any questions that you might have. Maybe you might like to send those through on chat and I'll open that up. And I truly hope to have the pleasure to speak with you again. So thank you, everybody. If there's any questions, again, I'm just going to keep that up or you could even unmute yourself and ask and I'll give a few minutes to see what rolls in. Yeah. How, how is it the process of getting there? Because it's kind of you know, remote and... Yeah, um, 
it is remote. So I took uh, a plane, obviously, um, but to give you a fuller answer on that, I went with Ethiopian Airways. They fly five times a week from Toronto to Ethiopia, the capital of Addis Ababa, and they have one of the most extensive networks across Africa and one of the newest fleets of aircraft. The Toronto Addis Ababa flight clocks in at 16 hours, but they operated on a Dreamliner. So, you know, if you break that down, that's actually longer than, say, Vancouver to Sydney, Australia. Um, Ethiopian is also a partner with Air Canada, so for connecting from other Canadian gateways like Regina, um, they can get you a through ticket all the way. So I was leaving from Halifax and uh, they just checked us in and um, 24 hours approximately to get from Halifax to Toronto to Ethiopia and then to Kilimanjaro Airport. Nice. KLM also does a Calgary, Amsterdam, um, Kilimanjaro. They fly right into Kilimanjaro and they have WestJet uh, affiliation to bring you through to their gateway in Calgary. Uh, 